Um, our first speaker for the day is Clark Alejandrino. He teaches at Trinity College in Connecticut, and he finished his PhD in East Asian Environmental History at Georgetown, which is where um, Dagmar de Groot works right now. Professor Alejandrino specializes in environmental history in China, especially its climate and animal history, covering the 5th to the 20th century in his research. And he's currently preparing a book manuscript on typhoons in the history of the South China coast, which he mentioned as I was talking to him before is a little bit more about the affective experience of climate change. Um, and I also want to note for you that he spent uh, a year as a high school teacher before he got his PhD and also did some college teaching in the Philippines. So, so welcome Professor Alejandrino and I'll turn it over to you. Hello, um, nice to meet you all. Um, Teaching high school was, as I was telling Shane, was one of my most memorable experiences and some of the habits, hopefully good habits that I gained um, teaching that one year of high school um, are still with me. Um, and, and I'd love to talk to you guys after the talk, not only about um, the con what I'm going to talk about, but also about, you know, experiences uh, teaching social studies and teaching climate history and climate change. Um, so let me just open the slideshow. So the topic for today is Little Ice Age in 17th century China. And the goals um, for my talk is to help us understand how the Little Ice Age may have shaped the fortunes of the Ming and the Qing empires, particularly in the 17th century and to reflect on the complexity of how climate change impacts history and the different roles and agencies that range from the human to the non-human. Let me start with um, this. You may have seen something like this in your previous, um, the previous lectures, probably with Sam, either Sam or Dagomar's talk, you may, they may have shown something like this. Um, as you, he, Sam probably introduced you to the timeline and the concept of the little ice age. Um, it was basically more of a Northern hemisphere kind of phenomenon, most, most felt pronounced in the Northern hemisphere. Shane mentioned that it's, uh, that Sugata had said it's kind of Eurocentric, but um, there is a lot of evidence to show that at least in the Northern hemisphere, in parts, other parts of the world like China, um, Little Ice Age was indeed also felt and did have an impact on the history of the society of these places. Um, so you can see from this uh, graph that uh, the Little Ice Age was marked by, was not always um, a cold period. So there were centuries or decades that were colder than others and possible Sam or Dagomar may have mentioned this. Um, I want to focus your attention primarily to the Grindelwald fluctuation uh, and the Maunder minimum. Um, and we'll, we'll keep returning back to this uh, graph um, later on. But Shane, did, did any of them tackle these um, ups and downs of the Little Ice Age? Probably Sam um, may, may have done it. They talked a little bit about it. We certainly saw this graph. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't remember if they named the Grindelwald and Maunder minimum. I think we did look at, um, you know, we, we saw this. I don't know if you want to go into a little bit more depth about um, mm -hmm. extremeness of any, either of those. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I shall since they, they didn't. And so, some of this is crucial to understanding what happened in China in the 17th century. So um, when you talk about minimum, um, so the Little Ice Age had, many causes or possible causes. And this is something uh, scientists and historians are still exploring. Um, but it's generally agreed that some of the things that helped create the colder climate of the Little Ice Age are, the, are periods of solar minimum. When you say solar minimum, these are periods when the, the sun doesn't have a lot of um, sunspots. Uh, sunspots are correlated with more intense solar radiation, which helps to warm the earth. And the Little Ice Age was marked by periods of solar minimum. Um, these were some of the, the latest. Um, so July of 2000, uh, 2000 was a year of solar maximum. You can see the sunspots uh, in two different photos. And 
2009 was a solar minimum, and you can see the difference uh, with the sun not having a lot of sunspots. And so you can see here, um, the little ice age was punctuated by certain periods of solar minimum, the Sporer minimum, the Maunder minimum, and the Dalton minimum. We also know that uh, this little ice age, the colder climate was also due in part to volcanic activity, which spewed uh, dust into the stratosphere, blocking sunlight and thus cooling the climate. Uh, we know the identities of some of these volcanoes that helped bring about colder climate, especially during the 16th century and the 17th century, which is around the, the, the point in time that we're talking about in terms of China and the Ming-Qing transition. So we know that Nevado del Ruiz uh, in Colombia erupted in 1595. Uh, in Peru, uh, Potina um, erupted in 1600, and both of these volcanoes spewed massive amounts of dust into the stratosphere, thus helping to cool the climate. So these were the coldest periods of the Little Ice Age. Um, these are the rough dates um, and Basically, the Little Ice Age at its coldest meant that there was a lowering of average global temperatures by at least one degree Celsius, and in some places, perhaps even two degrees Celsius. Now, uh, most relevant to my uh, topic is the Grindelwald fluctuation. This was not uh, primarily caused by solar minimum, um, but the evidence for the colder climate uh, polar weather in particular in the Northern Hemisphere um, from around 1560 to 1628. Um, the evidence for this is the, a glacier in Switzerland called uh, Grindelwald. And you can see from this graph that uh, between 1560 and 1628, the glacier was at its uh, largest um, during this time period, which means that the climate at that time was probably colder, which allowed the glacier to grow. And as you can see across the century, the, the remaining centuries up to today, the glacier has retreated as the global temperature is warming. So these are Swiss glaciers um, and where they would have been during the Little Ice Age and where they are today because of global warming. This is one of those proxy evidences, uh, glaciers that allow us to reconstruct past climate. And the period, the Grindelwald fluctuation, 1560 to 1628, um, is conveniently uh, coincides with the period when China transitioned from between the Ming dynasty and the Qing dynasty. So the Ming dynasty, 1368 to 1644, and Qing dynasty replaces the Ming in 1644 and lasts until 1911. Um, the Little Ice Age actually intersects with three major dynasties in Chinese history, the Mongol Yuan Dynasty, the Ming and the Manchu Qing Dynasties or empires. If you're interested in the ways in which the Yuan and the Ming Dynasties were connected by their experience of cold climate and periods of bad weather and human catastrophe during the Little Ice Age, I highly recommend this book by Timothy Brook called The Troubled Empire. Um, this will not be the subject of my talk because I'm going to talk about the Ming and the Qing dynasty transition, but anyone interested in the Yuan and the Ming um, and the Little Ice Age should consult this um, great book by Timothy Brook. So the topic for today is the Ming and Qing transition Little Ice Age. I just want to um, point to you to a nice video made by someone on YouTube. Uh, which shows the Ming and the Qing dynasty transition for every five days. Um, so the, it changes. So someone did a lot of research. I, I can tell this was done very meticulously. And if you wanted to show, ask your students, if you're teaching this topic, um, you can ask them to go on YouTube or you can show this in class. And um, this is a great kind of like visualization of how China changed from the Ming to the Qing dynasty in terms of territory. And I won't show the whole thing, but just um, some portion of it. So you can see here, uh, this is the Ming Dynasty. Sorry, let me turn the, yeah. This is the Ming Dynasty and here, and you can see here in this, in this 
um, towards the early 17th century, late 16th century going to the early 17th century, this blue area here is the emerging Qing state, the Manchu state. And here in gray, gray colors are Mongol tribes, the Eastern Mongols. And by the, what date is this? About 1628, towards the end of the Grindelwald fluctuation, um, you can see that the Qing state has expanded into the Mongol steppe um, and parts of Northern Ming. And here you can see the Qing consolidated by 1636. And this is ready in 1644, the Qing has begun its invasion of uh, the Ming China, which it completes its conquest by the 1680s. Okay, so this is kind of a visualization of that conquest and that transition. Okay. So from that video and from that um, op op introduction to the Grindelwald fluctuation, um, some questions we need to answer are, what impact did the Liya have on the fall of the Ming? the rise of the Manchus and the Manchu subjugation of both the Mongols and the Ming. And also what kind of impact did the Little Ice Age have on early Qing governance? And these are some questions I'll try to answer in what remains in this presentation. So this is probably the most typical kind of sim sim simple or maybe even simplistic explanation of the impact of the Little Ice Age on um, the fall of the Ming, uh, simply put, uh, colder weather led to failed harvests, failed harvests plus uh, a state struggling to make ends meet and thus increases taxation leads to peasant unrest. This peasant unrest blows up into rebellion. And we know that uh, towards the end of the Ming dynasty, several major rebellions break up break out, in particular, the Li Zicham Rebellion of 1644 um, brings um, rebel peasant forces into Beijing, which they capture it in 1644. And the last Ming emperor, the Chong, Chong, Chongzhen emperor, hangs himself behind the Forbidden City um, and helps bring about the end of the Ming dynasty. And in this kind of story, it's a bit of a climate deterministic kind of sledgehammer approach to telling the story of the fall of the Ming. Um, the big cause of the fall of the Ming is climate, the colder climate, the little ice age, which brings a bunch of consequences that I mentioned, the failed harvest, the peasant rebellions and the fall of the Ming. And this is something that appears in a lot of articles, especially by scientists who probably are not familiar with the more complex history I'm going to tell you today. Um, and it also kind of is uh, the dominant kind of narrative in Jeffrey Parker's chapter on the Ming China in the global crisis, though at least at the very least, Jeffrey Parker tries to show how people understood it. And he cites a lot of primary sources in translation. Um, so his is a much more complicated account, but the general idea of climate being this monopausal um, thing that leads to a certain leads to a series of historical events is still very much present in in in, in the book, the book chapter. And it's this kind of um, you know um, kind of cor correlations becoming causation is very typical of a lot of these uh, climate change and history articles that are coming out recently. So this is just one of many studies that try to kind of explain China's dynastic cycles, dynastic change through climate change. So they would argue that you know um, dynasties always start during warm periods and they end during cold periods. So it's kind of this very simple and to me simplistic kind of explanatory model for how dynasties change and using climate as the sole kind of factor that causes regimes to change within Chinese history. 
And we're going to complicate that today just by focusing on the Ming and Qing transition. So back again to this uh, graph. Um, one of the things I, that Sam or Dagomar may have mentioned is that people sometimes often forget that the Little Ice Age was also had periods of warming. It wasn't always uh, centuries or decades of colding, co uh, colder weather. Um, there were certain warm phases of the Little Ice Age. And in particular for Chinese history, it's important to note that um, the, the early half of the 16th century, somewhere between, depending on which climatologist or which historian you ask, um, some people say it started in the 1500s, some people say it started in the 1530s, we're still doing research on this. And some people say this warm phase ended around 1550s and others say goes on to about as late as the 1580s. Um, what is clear though from the evidence and from what uh, historians have uh, gathered is that the first half of the 16th century um, saw uh, expansion in terms in, in Ming China, in terms of population, there was uh, tremendous population growth. Um, when the dynasty started in 1368, there was probably around 60 million people. But by the end of the 16th century, uh, the number is probably around 80 or even 90 million um, people living in Ming China. Um, there was part of this population growth was uh, course was a growth in food production and also um, economic production. So we know that um, agricultural production expanded greatly during the first half of the 16th century. And also textile production in the form of silk has also uh, expanded, um, ex also expanded in the first half of the 16th century. So you have here on the left, some Ming dynasty block prints, wood block prints of people planting rice and on the right uh, of women working on silk machi machines for um, so, so weaving silk. And uh, the 16th century was also marked by uh, an increasing demand for goods from China. Um, so if today made in China often has negative connotations um, in 16th all the way up to the 18th century and even the first half of the 19th century, made in China was a good thing. Uh, there was a large demand all across the world, especially in Europe, of Chinese goods, particularly Ming blue and white porcelain, which you see here, uh, tea, which was only produced in China up to the 19th century, and also silk. Uh, silk was the big, had the biggest demand across the world. And all of these were very profitable goods because they were not only highly valued and in demand, but they were also light and easy to transport. So they, they, they were high value plus easy to transport. So there was a very large demand for made in, Chinese, made in China goods uh, during the 16th century. And we know that uh, Europeans did their best to find their way to Asia. Um, Columbus tried to do it by sailing directly west. Uh, the Portuguese tried to do it by going around the Cape of Good Hope to eventually reaching India. And by the late 16th century, uh, Europeans had found their way on the doorsteps of China. The Portuguese established themselves on the island of Macau in 1557 and the Spanish uh, established a colony in Manila, where I'm from, in 1571. Um, we'll go back to this picture in a while. Um, there, were, there, were, there were a lot of things that the Europeans wanted from China, particularly, as I said, silk, tea, and porcelain. Um, Europeans didn't have a lot of things that the Chinese wanted. Um, there was one good that the Chinese were really interested in, and that was silver. And that's because in, in the 16th century, um, a lot of people in China preferred to use silver as a medium of exchange. Um, and by the 1580s, uh, the Ming government recognized this popular um, demand for silver by commuting all of their taxes, all of people's taxes into silver. So prior to the 1580s, people generally um, 
there was a very complicated system of paying taxes in Ming China. Some people paid it in grain. Some people paid it in terms of service or corvi labor. Um, and some people paid it in, in, in money, copper cash or silver. And in 1580, the state made the decision to commute all taxes into silver. So regardless of what tax you were paying in the past, you would now pay it all in silver. And the consequence of this reform was that it, it, there was a huge demand for silver because now everybody, you know, millions of people in China had to pay their taxes in silver every year. And so there was a large demand for silver. And this was something that Europeans could supply because they now had, the Spanish in particular, having conquered most of North and South America, now had access to the silver mines in Mexico and Peru. So the most famous uh, uh, silver mine in world history is at Potosi, um, which I think is currently in Bolivia, if I'm not mistaken, but was once part of the new Viceroyalty of Peru. And Going back to this map, this so a lot of this silver from the Americas arrived in China by way of Manila. And I'll show you a map of the galleon trade in a while. I just have to mention that the Portuguese got their silver through Japan. So Japan was also a major producer of silver at that time. And the Portuguese operated a very lucrative trade between Macau and Nagasaki. They would get they would buy silver from the Japanese at Nagasaki bring it to Macau where the silver was exchanged with the Chinese for Chinese goods like silk tea and porcelain. And these Chinese goods were then shipped back to Portugal via India um, and sold in Europe for a high profit. The Spanish did the same. Um, they would ship silver from Peru and Mexico through Acapulco to Manila. Chinese merchants would go to Manila and exchange Chinese goods for Mexican silver. And the Chinese merchants would bring this silver back to China. And then the galleons would then bring the Chinese goods back across the Pacific to Acapulco, where from Acapulco, it would be shipped back to Europe um, through the Atlantic. So one of the things that, um, that historians previously um, attributed one of the major reasons the Ming fell was because of silver inflation. So as um, a lot of silver was flowing into China, both through Japan and through, uh, through Manila, um, the, the price of silver, the value of silver um, experienced an inflation. Um, the, as supply increased, the price of the value of silver went down and this might have had a negative impact on the economy and on society in um, towards the end of the Ming Dynasty. So anywhere from 50 tons to 115 tons were entering of silver were entering Ming China each year from the late 16th century to the early 17th century. Half of this from, from Japan and the rest from Peru and Mexico. And it's estimated that at least a third of all the silver mined in the Americas ended up in China. And uh, inflation of silver and stress on the, on the economy um, was one factor that has traditionally been, um, been given a lot of uh, credit for explaining the downfall of the Ming, but it wasn't the only one, of course. Now, uh, the, all this trade between China and Europe and the rest of the world uh, was also fueling a lot of environmental and social change within China itself. So uh, Chinese uh, farmers interested in participating in this lucrative trade of Chinese goods um, converted many of their lands into, to, into from growing rice for, for sustenance into growing cash crops like silk. So as I said, silk was highly priced, the most prized Chinese commodity at that time. And for example, in Southern China, in Guangdong province, uh, many peasants converted their rice fields into so-called mulberry tree and fish bond systems. And uh, mulberry tree is the tree that, that on which the silkworm feeds on. And so you need to have mulberry trees in order to create silk. And um, there's a lot of evidence and historians have done written books about this, about how um, 
large tracts of land in certain parts of China, the lower Yangtze region, the Guangdong, the South China coast were converted into um, mulberry tree kind of farms. And one of the consequences of this is that um, that meant that China's economy was becoming more commercialized. And you can see regions starting to specialize in particular goods and cash crops. But as these regions convert from rice to silk, for example, growing silk and growing tea, the people, these people who are growing these cash crops need to be fed. And so other regions in, um, adjacent to these cash crop growing regions then start to specialize in food production to feed these regions that are no longer producing their own food. Now, one of the consequences of this in terms of the fall of the Ming is that this may have exacerbated uh, food security problems. So if people are no longer growing food for themselves and they're reliant on other people to grow food for themselves, uh, for them, um, then if a disaster like the colder climate occurs and it, um, it affects the harvest in the regions that are producing food for other people, other regions, then this could have a very catastrophic impact on large parts of the empire. Whereas if different parts of the empire were all producing their own food, then the impact of um, a colder climate and poor harvest in some regions might not have as big of an impact on the empire. Um, so this is one thing to consider. Another thing, um, Another explanation for the fall of the Ming in the early, in the 17th century is that uh, the Ming didn't have a lot of good emperors uh, towards the end of the dynasty. In particular, during the Grindelwald fluctuation uh, from 1568 to 1620, uh, 1560 to 1628, it also coincided with the rule of this emperor, the Wanli emperor, who ruled from 1572 to 1620. And he was notorious for refusing to govern. So he wasn't a stupid emperor. There's this great book, by, which I'll talk about a bit, uh, by Ray Huang, who wrote kind of this biography of this emperor. And he showed that this emperor was actually quite intelligent. But he didn't like governing. And he deliberately avoided uh, attending court um, for most of his reign. And a lot of decisions required the emperor's approval. For example, whenever an official uh, died or vacated a post, only the emperor could replace that the person in that position. And so during this long reign from 1570 to 1620, um, every time a post was vacated, the problem was that there was no one to, even though there were lots of people in line qualified to take over that position, they couldn't because the emperor wouldn't uh, wouldn't govern or wouldn't approve any kind of um, less legislation or 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 rules, and instead he relied on eunuchs. Uh, this was a time period when eunuchs uh, start to become very active in uh, being government, and um, these kinds of factional rivalries would also play their part in the fall of the Ming Dynasty. So if you're interested in this emperor uh, who basically refused to rule, uh, you can read this book by Ray Huang called 1587, A Year of No Significance. So um, for this section, The Fall of the Ming, uh, what I want to say is that colder climate did have an impact on harvests. And this, this of course, probably led to late Ming peasant rebellions. However, it's not a simple cause and effect kind of narrative because we have to also consider other factors the height, that heighten the population's precarity and, and the limited state ability to adapt. We already, already told you that uh, Ming China's population grew tremendously during the 16th century. And this larger population needed to be fed in an increasingly commercialized economy where segments of the population were no longer growing their own food. And, there was a growing market economy that was susceptible to possible economic shocks, such as silver inflation. There was also politically much apathy from a long reigning emperor 
and a government that was unable to capitalize on commercial growth to expand its physical capacity to adapt um, to natural disasters. So the Ming, uh, another thing I have to say is that the Ming primarily saw itself as an agrarian empire and its source of taxation was primarily agricultural in terms of rice and grain. And it never really developed the capacity to make use to, to take advantage of all the commercial growth and the trade that was occurring, especially along the coast. And so it wasn't able to derive profit from the growing commercialization of the Chinese empire. And unfortunately, that meant that when disaster actually happened, the government was very limited in its capacity to deal with um, failed harvests and, and um, peasant rebellions. Okay, now, what other question you need to ask is, yeah, sorry, yes, Shane. I just wanted to give you a time check and say about 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes left or 10 minutes? 10 minutes before we move to Q&A. Okay, so uh, the, the Ming were also, if the Ming were affected by the cold climate, shouldn't the Manchus have been affected as well? And traditionally the kind of um, people have also said that uh, probably the Manchus invaded China because they too were affected by the cold climate and they moved south in order to find greener pastures. And uh, who are the Manchus? Well, they were this um, uh, group of, uh, semi-nomadic people in Manchuria in Northeast China today called the Jurchens. Um, they lived in a kind of mixed environment and um, they, some of them hunted in the forests, some of them hunted on the, uh, grazed on uh, cattle on the steppes and some, some of them engaged in some form of agriculture in uh, the Liaotong Plains. So they lived in a kind of mixed environment in Manchuria and kind of maybe this diversification of um, their, their food sources may have helped them weather the colder um, climate of the Little Ice Age. Um, it was certainly a multicultural land also. Um, not only were the Manchurians, the, the Jurchen themselves engaged in different special specializations, um, but there was a significant population of Mongolians and Han Chinese who also migrated to Manchuria uh, for reasons that are possibly climate related, as I'll mention. Um, so we, this very recent study that came out in 2019 uh, actually tried to answer this question of how did the Little Ice Age affect the Manchurians in comparison to the Mongols and the Ming? And to summarize the results of this study by Tsui and Burr, uh, what they discovered through proxy evidence is that the Liaotong Peninsula, where the Manchus were based, had more stable temperature and precipitation compared to the Ming territories in the Mongol grasslands. So in short, what they're saying is um, the Manchus were not as severely affected by uh, the colder climate, which may help to explain their, their, how they weathered it better and how they were able to conquer both the Mongols and the Ming. So what, we, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that we have to take into consideration regional variations. We can't assume that colder climate affected everyone similarly, even if they were near each other, because regional variations do make a diff can make a difference. And so uh, the Manchus uh, were unified under, the Jurchens were unified under the leaders, leader uh, Nurgati. Um, I'll skip these because we can talk about these later. They were able to make a profit from selling uh, ginseng to the Ming and which they used to uh, buy Ming cannons and other firearms. And they reorganized the Jurchen army into a very efficient banner system that reflected the kind of multicultural and multi-ethnic backgrounds of the Manchus, mix of Mongols, Jurchens, and Han. And uh, under this Manchu ruler, Hong Haiti, um, he signaled the, his intention to conquer both the Mongols and the Ming, and the Mongols were actually subjugated by the Manchus in 1634. And in 1644, the Manchus invaded China, Ming China. Uh, as I mentioned, the Beijing had already fallen to peasant rebellions in 1644, which is the task of the Manchus as they 
entered the Great Wall and conquered China, the rest of China by the late 17th century. And so this is what uh, China looked like around 1660s, um, the Manchu homeland in pink, Ming territories in uh, light green. And these are territories that they would take later on in the 18th century, the outer Mongolia, Xinjiang and Tibet and Taiwan. And so what does a little ice age have to do with the rise of the Manchus? Well, uh, it seems that the latest research suggests that the Manchu homeland is not as severely affected by colder climate compared with the Ming and Mongol territories. And some are speculating now that the migration of Han and Mongols to Manchu lands may have been climate induced. And this in turn probably helped the Manchus because the Manchus became very familiar with both Han and Mongol ways of life and they utilize their relationships with Han and Mongols to their advantage. Um, so the early Qing governance, how did the Little Ice Age affect it? Well, um, the early Qing government was very much in um, dealing with the economic depression of both the wars and also the colder climate. And so he, economic historians have identified the reign of the Kangxi Emperor as uh, coinciding with an economic depression uh, in China called the Kangxi Depression, which lasted from 1660 to 1690. And the Qing weathered this depression quite well. Um, what they did was one is they didn't change much in terms of Ming economics. Uh, Ming economics basically was low taxes and minimal governance and intervention. And they did the same thing. They instituted low tax regime in China. Um, easing the burden on peasants and also not alienating uh, the, this large population of China from um, the Qing. But they were very much aware that the Ming fell because they were unable to deal with natural disasters. And so even though they instituted a low tax regime, the Qing was much more paternalistic than the Ming. So they, the Qing governance was uh, very much marked by um, concern over, for example, floods. And so the Qing invested much more into flood control. The Yellow River dikes were rebuilt and um, managed much better under the Qing rather than the Ming. And the Qing went so far as to establish one of the world history's greatest social uh, nets. Um, they established a ever normal granary system that was designed to provide famine relief. So every county in theory in, in Qing China had a official granary which bought grain during times of plenty and sold grain to the populace at a cheap price during times of need. And this, uh, many historians of the world consider this to be one of the greatest achievements of any empire in the early modern period. Um, so what relationship did the Little High Sage have with early Qing governance? Well, the Manchu rulers were conscious of why the Ming fell. And so they kept taxes low, like the Ming, but was more paternalistic in other areas such as flood control and famine relief. It did help that the 18th century was when the Little Ice Age was heading into a warmer stage. So in conclusion, um, what I want to say is that the Little Ice Age certainly had an impact on the fortunes of the Ming and the Qing, but not in the kind of simplistic, you know, um, A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to D kind of uh, climate deterministic way. The problems that plagued the Ming toward the end were not all stemming from climate. Um, I've shown you the silver inflation, the growing population, the commercialization of the economy, and perhaps growing food insecurity. There was also political apathy with some of the last emperors of the Ming. And if climate was a tipping point, it was only because of many other human factors that were woven into it. Differences in climate may have also influenced the rise of the Qing and the relative stability of the early Qing. But the Qing was certainly also more conscious of establishing safeguards against the environmental disasters that brought down the Ming. So one of the things I might say is that had the Ming, for example, been as paternalistic as the Qing, perhaps the Ming might not have fallen um, victim to the colder climate of the 17th century or the Grindelwald fluctuation. So I think if the Qing was in power, 
during that time, and they had this ever normal granular system, this social net, it's possible Qing would not have fallen the way the Ming did. So it's not a simple story of colder climate brings down an agrarian empire. It still depends on what that agrarian empire was doing uh, at the, prior to and during the, when the colder climate hit. And so thank you, that's it. And I hope I made it to the 10 minutes. You did exactly on time. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry to interrupt you. I could tell I made you a little bit nervous there or like, you know, you felt under pressure, but I appreciate you doing that.